Hello and welcome to another session in physics. In this session, we'll be looking at the topic scalar and vector quantities. But before that, let us review the previous lesson. Welcome back. Well, in this particular section of scalars and vector quantities, we'll be looking at the concepts of scalar and vector quantities. Remember in your previous lessons, we've already mentioned that a scalar is one which has only magnitude. And by magnitude, we mean size, but it has no direction whatsoever. Examples of scalar quantities are distance, speed, temperature, volume, work, energy, power, mass, electric potential, gravitational potential, and electric charge, including a host of other quantities that do not have direction, but they have magnitude, they can be quantified, and they have size. In the next slide, let's talk about vector quantities. Now, vector quantities are simply the opposite of scalar quantities, in the sense that vector quantities have both magnitude and direction. They have what scalar quantities have and they also have what scalar quantities do not have, which is direction. Examples of these vector quantities are force, weight, velocity, acceleration, momentum, displacement, magnetic flux, electric fields and gravitational fields, all the force fields specifically, they are all vector quantities one after the other. Alright, let's see how vector representation can be done or how vectors can be represented. It might interest you to note that a vector quantity can be represented graphically when we use a line and we draw that line such that the length of the line denotes the magnitude of the quantity. And then we put an arrowhead next to the line which indicates the direction in which that vector quantity is acting. So basically, let's say we're trying to denote a distance of 5 kilometers west, in the west direction. So probably we can just um, we can just draw it like this. We try and show this direction and then we calculate instead of 5 kilometers, we use 5 cm. Of course, we know 5 cm is to 5 is to 1 unit place like um, instead of 5 kilometers we have 5 cm so 1 cm is to 1 kilometer rather 1 cm being 1 kilometer so of course you know you cannot draw 5 kilometers in your book that's too much of a distance so you use 1 cm in a ratio of 1 kilometer so you draw 5 cm to show 5 kilometers and then you just put your arrowhead here to show the direction you're pointing or let's say probably you're trying to come to the south direction in the south direction uh, you walked like and um, let's say three kilometers you can also draw a line of 3 cm where you know of course that 3 cm is to three kilometers like 1 cm being to one kilometer means 3 cm is equivalent to three kilometers so that's how vectors are represented with a line and an arrowhead that arrowhead means it is a vector and it is trying to show us the direction in which that quantity is acting. Interestingly, vectors can be added and subtracted just like scalars too. But there is one unique thing about the addition and subtraction of vectors and that is as a result of the direction in which they are acting. Because of the direction that they are acting, we don't just add them algebraically or anyhow we dim fit, but we have to take the direction into consideration. So, two or more vectors acting on a body in a specified direction can be combined to produce a single vector having the same effect. That single vector is called the resultant. So, let's say for instance, if you have two hammers, let's say you have um, this is a hammer head now for instance, um, this is a hammer head, so then you hold it here. Now, let's say this hammer can produce a force of 3 newtons and then you have another hammer, a smaller one. This smaller one can produce a force of 2 newtons. They will do the, the, the same work that a hammer, a very big hammer this time around. Let's say a hammer of 
five newtons they will accomplish the same task the only difference is that this is a single hammer that will produce a force of five newtons whereas you had to have two separate hammers doing that work for you take for example if you have two forces y and x and they have a magnitude of three newtons and four newtons respectively and they are acting along the same direction so let's use um, 4 newtons to represent the longer vector and we use 3 newtons to represent the shorter vector. The resultant is going to become 7 newtons. That is the algebraic sum of these two vectors because they are acting in the same direction. Now what if they are acting in opposite direction? So for instance, this is the longer one, 4 newtons and this is the shorter one, 3 newtons. For the fact that they are acting in opposite directions, all you just have to do is subtract this smaller vector from the bigger vector and you're going to have one newton as your resultant. So that's how to calculate vectors acting in the same direction or in opposite directions. And then we have times when two vectors can be inclined perpendicularly to each other. They are inclined at angles that are either less than 90 degrees or angles that are more than 90 degrees so we're looking at um something like this this is more than 90 or this is less than 90 then you put the arrowhead here arrowhead here arrowhead here and here for this sort of situations we use what we call parallelogram law of vectors to try to add them or you have what we call the cosine rule and the, um, the sine rule that's what we use to try to find their resultant at any point in time or we can also use scale drawings where we have to calculate the scale from here to here we calculate the scale from here to here as well we use it to find their resultant and what if we have vectors exactly at the right angle you can draw better than this and then you're asked to find the resultants. Don't forget to put your arrow here and your arrow here too. So what you're going to do to find the resultant of this is to use Pythagoras theorem. Use Pythagoras theorem. Pythagoras was a Greek mathematician that made stratospheric impacts in the field of angles. So Pythagoras said that the three sides of an angle is labeled, uh, let's say, A, B, C respectively and that the longest side is called the hypotenuse this is the hypotenuse and this side is called the opposite and the remaining side is called the adjacent so Pythagoras theorem was trying to say that the square of the hypotenuse is going to be found by adding the square of the opposite to the square of the adjacent Using the same principle when it comes to um, the resultant of vectors acting at right angles to each other, we can say the resultant squared, this is our resultant now. This is our resultant and let's call this A and let's call this B. The resultant squared is going to become A squared plus B squared. A squared plus B squared. So that is going to be our resultant force. You use this formula and you show to find the answer to your question so after finding a squared and b squared all you just have to do is now remove the squared here and then find the square root of a squared and b squared and then you find your answer and that is for vectors acting at right angles to each other now like I mentioned earlier if the two vectors are inclined at an angle less than 90 they form what we call an acute angle so for an acute angle vectors acting like an acute angle and you have to use scale drawing using your protractor in order to discover the angle in between the forces then you complete the parallelogram completing the parallelogram you will calculate the distance between here and here and that will help you to find the resultant and the accompanying fraction what about finding the resultant of more than two vectors acting at the point? The resultant of more than two vectors acting at a point. Let's try to see what we mean when we talk about two vectors, more than two vectors acting at a point. 
so let's see we have um, something that looks like this let's say we have something that looks like this and then we have vectors acting in this direction then we have another one acting in this direction now all of these are vectors I'm going to try to give them nomenclature one after the other we have one here we have another one here and then we have um, one acting uh, in this direction the arrows represent the vectors only so this one this one is not a vector this one is not a vector so we have the accompanying um, angles so let me name them f1 we have f2 we have f3 and then we have f4 now we need to find the resultant and then we also need to find the angle it makes with the horizontal we need to find the resultant and the angle that it makes with the horizontal for us to find them we need to resolve we need to resolve resolve all resolve all the forces in the x this is point one resolve all the forces in the x and y axis x and y axis let me make it clear that this is a positive y axis this is a negative y axis this is a positive x axis and these are negative x axis so for our x and y axis our vertical and horizontal uh, axis respectively and then we have to take notes taking notes of plus x and and plus y respectively and also we have to take notes of minus x and minus y and minus x and minus um minus y as well all right so it simply means that we're going to have something like um, on the next slide we're going to have something like a table where we'll have our horizontal components and then here we have our vertical components our horizontal components and our vertical components so we just underline them so we'll have f1 cos theta 1 f2 cos theta 2 minus f3 cos theta 3 minus f4 cos theta 4 the reason why we have minus f3 here is because f3 is acting down so anything down and left down left is negative up right is positive down left is negative up right is positive so on the vertical axis we have f1 vertical is acting upwards and downwards any force acting upwards is plus f any force acting downwards such as like we have here in f2 f2 is acting downwards with vertical is going to become minus f2 sine theta sine theta is the vertical component of forces y cos theta is the horizontal component of a force f3 sine theta 3 and this one is plus f4 sine theta 4 so we add all of them algebraically so for the x we're going to have f1 cos theta 1 plus f2 cos theta 2 minus f3 cos theta 3 minus f4 cos theta 4 and then for the y components we're going to have f1 sine theta 1 minus f2 sine theta 2 minus f3 sine theta 3 plus f4 sine theta 4 now if a vector is directly aligned with the x axis we say that its angle of inclination theta is equal to zero in contrast if a vector is directly aligned with the y axis we say that its angle of inclination theta is equal to 90 degrees and that's it for today thank you so much for joining us in this lesson to refresh your memory on what we've just discussed please take the test that will appear on your screen